everyone. Welcome to our penultimate week here in post-communist studies. Uh, we are now venturing into largely uncharted territory. Um, we have sold our Lada, and uh, because the roads are going to be pretty rough, if not non-existent, uh, we're renting a Range Rover, and we're going to be traveling to an area that I would imagine most Americans, most listeners, know very little about. Central Asia is a region that is quite possibly the least understood of the former Soviet Union and probably the most authoritarian of the former communist world. Uh, Central Asia is also a region which I'm sure you all know countries ending in stand. I'm sure you can um, remember some of them, right? Kazakhstan, uh, Tajikistan, uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan. Of course, uh, we also have to include Pakistan and Afghanistan. They were not part of the Soviet Union. But Central Asia um, historically has been that one section of this class that the students walk away from f being the most interested in afterwards. I think it's because it's just such a a blank page for so many people. And there's so little that's talked about it, um, particularly in Western uh, and more particularly American media, that students find it to just, just be absolutely fascinating um, in terms of uh, the resources, the people, the politics, um, really sort of the do-it-yourself statehood uh, that effectively befell these five countries um, after 1991. So when we look at Central Asia vis-a-vis uh, -vis the post-communist world, um, we are looking at countries that emerged for the first time um, in early 1991, um, and we're almost, um, you know, startled to find out at, at the end of, the, uh, of that year that the Soviet Union had collapsed and that these constituent Soviet republics now find themselves sovereign states. Um, and, you know, this is a great way to bookend uh, the specifics of this class, because if we juxtapose Central Asia with Central Europe, we are really talking about countries that not only have to um, develop government and a political society almost from scratch, but carve out a culture as well. And that's not to say that these regions are devoid of culture, far from it, right? The, the area has a rich, rich history um, within the region. But what specifically is Kazakh or Uzbek? You know, prior to that, it really was a conglomeration of many different cultures, civilizations, and traditions. Now, suddenly, states have to create the very symbols and institutions of office that relatively came easy to Poland or Hungary or the Czech Republic. Um, you know, even when we look at, let's say, uh, the former Soviet Union's Caucasus state, Georgia, Armenia, um, Azerbaijan, and not so much, but definitely Georgia and Armenia, um, both of them have a rich history with a definitive language and identity or religion that they can all fall back on. Central Asia is really, um, you know, a blank page when it comes to statehood. And because the region is so far removed from the center of influence of the European Union, um, we, you know, we're talking about countries that are transitioning largely on their own, but if you can see on this map here, within the external influence of two great powers, Russia, which Central Asia never lost its affinity towards and uh, you know, association with, and of course, China. Right, so now we're talking about the influence of the Chinese, and this is especially true uh, within the last decade. So if we're to um, acknowledge the importance of external actors in influencing and shaping uh, the politics and the society and the cultures of these emerging countries, um, Russia and China certainly are no big proponents of democracy. And while they wouldn't necessarily be opposed uh, to democracy, uh, you know, growing in any of these countries. And the, you know, the next lecture that we're going to look at specifically is that in Kyrgyzstan, they're equally happy working with countries that are, um, you know, single member dictatorships, which is really what Central Asia um, is largely understood to be. So, you know, for the uninitiated, right, this is our crash course in Central Asia post-1991. And, you know, without any argument whatsoever, we are looking at the least democratic region in the entire post-communist world. Um, 
where democracy is nascent or fledgling, um, we are looking really at weak hybrid regimes. Uh, most of these countries have exceptionally low levels of political rights and civil liberties, um, some of them being um, regarded by Freedom House as the worst of the worst. Um, up until recently, um, Uzbekistan and even currently today Turkmenistan are you know, up there with North Korea in terms of statewide repression, uh, control of the media, um, demobilization, if not outright um, criminalization of any opposition. And, you know, we're, we're really looking at states that underwent little to no significant regime change following the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, many of Central Asia's longtime leaders some of them still exerting, um, you know, significant degrees of influence, um, were basically regional governors of the Soviet Union. So, you know, the ruling elites, the ruling parties have remained in power basically since the 1980s. Um, you know, I, I had alluded in one of the previous lectures of uh, Putin being kind of like the, um, the, the, the Soviet equivalent to Grand Admiral Thrawn, right, as the empire collapses. Um, to stick with that variable here, many of these leaders and apparatchiks of Central Asia uh, were kind of like regional, you know, moths or grand moths of the empire after the Battle of Endor, who just kind of uh, seized control of their planetary sectors and just kind of became these self-proclaimed, um, you know, demagogues, tin pot dictators, and what have you. So, you know, there's no Václav Havel, there's no Lech Valenza, you know, you know, give me an Alexander Dubček any day here. But um, no, I mean, we are talking about regional leaders that basically just, re you know, retained control over the former SSRs that they had led um, and actually increased the authoritarianism in these countries since 1991, right? So we're looking really at um, any, and, you know, an increase in authoritarianism from, let's say, the bureaucratic model of Gorbachev to what we could call sort of this sultanistic paternalism, um, you know, modeled around self-made demagogues. Um, and, you know, certainly those who have read the literature within democratic transition theory know that there is a term, an academic term called sultanism. It doesn't necessarily have to involve someone who is uh, Muslim, but it's a type of paternalistic rule. It's a type of family run um, enterprise that turns the state and most of its institutions really into, um, you know, private enterprise. So, you know, Central Asia is an area that has minimal, minimal levels of, uh, you know, global scrutiny and Western-based leverage. I mean, we are really talking about the periphery um, of the post-communist world. There is clearly no prospects at all for any kind of EU membership that's just not even in the cards, right? One could, you know, maybe think with enough, you know, hope and determination that we might think of the EU expanding into Ukraine or Georgia. When it comes to Central Asia, that's, you know, well, well beyond uh, the EU's uh, prospects. And, you know, even as far as the United States, um, this region was largely ignored prior to 2001. And the only reason why the United States started paying attention in 01 was because of the 9-11 attacks. And, you know, as far as the U.S. was concerned, we're not interested in really promoting democracy, democracy per se, as we are doing what the Russians have been doing, um, maintaining, you know, cooperative relations with authoritarian states that will allow, um, you know, foreign entities like, you know, the United States or the Russians to maintain a, a military base, um, a, an air base, something like that, right? But U.S. leverage within the region is tenuous at best. Um, the United States is really playing second fiddle um, to where the Russians and, you know, now uh, increasingly the, uh, the Chinese. So the strongest um, international link that Central Asia still has, I think, is arguably still uh, Russia. Uh, Russian is still uh, considered to be a primary language, especially among the upper classes, especially among the political elite. Uh, many Central Asian youth, uh, you know, people in their late teens, early 20s, 
uh, will naturally consider going to Russia to work and live there for a couple of years. You know, this is the equivalent to, let's say, Eastern Europeans in Poland or Croatia, you know, going to Germany to work. Well, Russia is that place to work as well. And, you know, as far as China is concerned, this is definitely the case in the last five to 10 years. Um, Central Asia is really becoming more and more of a place for venture capitalism, right? The, the, these large scale industrial projects, um, you know, road networks, um, hydroelectric dams, power plants, um, you know, heavy, heavy industry uh, that the Chinese are just investing, you know, tremendously uh, within the region. So, you know, this effectively leaves Central Asia outside of the sphere of influence of uh, Western uh, Euro-Atlantic influence. And if the EU has little to no um, leverage, uh, it, it is you know, equally uh, strategically remote uh, for NATO as well. So the region really is within um, an authoritarian influence coming from Moscow and Beijing. Not surprisingly, we're looking at a sea of purple here in terms of Freedom House. Um, this is the current data from 2020. And, uh, you know, in previous years, the only country that, um, you know, made it to that uh, B minus C plus partly free yellow was Kyrgyzstan. But following um, a number of internal um, struggles and, uh, you know, political jockeying, uh, the country that gave us some hope around 2005 to 2010, 11, 12, something like that, has once again just fallen right back into um, authoritarian models. So, you know, the best that we can look for right now in terms of post-Soviet states really lies here in Ukraine and Moldova, uh, Georgia, you know, and uh, Armenia. Not surprisingly, they're a lot closer uh, to the European center. Once again, a little shout out to Mongolia for this. They're just doing it. I don't know how or why. One of these days, I'll have a class and we'll find out. But, um, you know, as I had um, showed in the previous lecture about Russia and their pipeline diplomacy, um, this is very much the case in Central Asia as well, right? The pipelines do not just simply go to Germany, but they also have their endpoints in key countries like Iran and India. And just like Central Europe, in order to get to those strategic alliances, pipelines have to go through Central Asia. States here are much more compliant, much more cooperative than we can ever get from Ukraine, Poland, even Belarus, for that matter. So pipeline diplomacy certainly keeps these countries within Russia's sphere of influence, and uh, many of the uh, political elite within these countries um, are savvy enough to, uh, you know, make a good profit off of their relationship with Gazprom. But even more so is the never-ending flow of money that seems to be coming from China. And this is part of their large, grand-scale, one belt, one road initiative, right? It's basically China rebuilding what the Silk Road was, uh, you know, more than, you know, 500, 600 years ago. But not just in overland routes with major, major highways, but also sea routes, um, railway routes. I mean, all of this is just linking the Central Asian states within an emerging, um, you know, Chinese um, economic market. So between the Russians and the Chinese, the vast resources that are located within Central Asia, um, the prospects for any kind of, you know, liberal democracy, um, you know, even, you know, populist democracy um, is just outside of, you know, any kind of forecast for the foreseeable future. Again, the only country that may once again provide some inkling of hope is Kyrgyzstan. We'll focus on that in a separate standalone lecture. Be that as it may, right? And this is just the big intro. We're just taking lots of pictures from our Range Rover here, right? The nature of government of these five Central Asian states, the five stands, right? all engage in some varying degree of what um, Juan Linz and Alfred Stepan referred to as sultanism, right? Sultanism is a type of authoritarianism close to totalitarianism, but um, there's a couple of interesting nuances. A sultanistic state is one in which a ruling clique of socio-political elites, um, which are defined by personal ties to executive leadership, um, either exclusively define constitutional rule of law or, or sometimes and, are immune to it. So in other words, 
the country, the political system, the political apparatus, the economic markets, um, anything that leads to power and privilege within the state remains in the hands of this small cadre of individuals. And oftentimes, this involves being related to um, you know, the, the ruling leadership, either through family ties or through long-standing friendships and, and, and cooperations that you know, go back to the 80s, the 70s, even the 60s um, in that case, right? So you're part of a ruling family, and if you have those connections, you have access to money, power, influence, authority. If you don't, it doesn't matter how talented you are, doesn't matter how determined you are, you will be outside of that gated community unless you find some way of ingratiating yourself in. So, Sultanistic State is very much one of those states that is defined less by what you can do and more on who you know. Um, and, you know, the more the people that you know, the more likely you will have access to money and power. And trust me, money and power in Central Asia, if you can get it, is vast and at times seemingly limitless. This is propped up politically by what the literature for the week refers to as a hierarchic party system, right? A hierarchic party system, which there's not a lot of difference. You know, in a way, that this, there are some similar things, a hybrid regime, stabilitocracies, but this is just unabashedly authoritarian, right? In which leadership is focused on the, you know, the presence of an all-powerful executive presidency. So for at least four of the five Central Asian states, minus Kyrgyzstan, these countries are presidential systems. Kyrgyzstan tried to democratize its way to a parliamentary democracy, but recent attempts um, by um, opportunistic presidents have tried to once again, um, you know, grab back onto power by taking that away from the parliament. So, even, or, you know, four, four and a half countries. But a top-heavy executive presidency yields a political party around it, right? So very similar to, let's say, Putin and the United Russia Party. You know, in many ways, folks, Putin, the United Russia Party, sovereign democracy, this stuff actually takes a page or two from the handbook of Central Asian despots. So it's not that Putin is unique. Nay, nay. Remember, Putin comes 10 years after uh, the Soviet Union collapses. Many of these leaders, like Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, the longtime president of Kazakhstan, already you know, cornered the market in this type of party of power in which a political party grows around this presidency and is less a party of inclusive, like-minded members as it is just really a way of trying to legitimize um, those who have already seized power to, you know, never-ending plates at the, uh, at, at the trough. Um, are there opposition parties within these countries? Yes. So, you know, it's not that they are absolute dictatorships, although, you know, in the case of Turkmenistan, opposition is, I think, more for display purposes only. But you've got really two kinds of opposition. Um, you have soft opposition, you know, loyal opposition, you know, parties that exist outside of the main political leadership, and they might rhetorically have different points of view, but they're always going to vote with the incumbent government, right? So, you know, th this soft opposition is, well, I'm just going to say it, it's kind of like what the Democratic Party in the United States na is now to the Republicans, right? It looks like they're opposing it, but at the end of the day, they converge on a lot of things, especially when it comes to military spending, um, you know, halting any kind of advancement in social democratic values, um, and somehow believing that the richer you are, the more important you are type of thing, right? So this type of soft opposition exists across the, you know, across the board in Central Asia, and they oftentimes do get some privileges, some access to power for the illusion of multi-party plurality. This should not be um, confused with the existing, although far smaller and much more marginalized, hard opposition. A hard opposition falls into two categories. The first is, yeah, that handful of people that truly believe in the cause for democracy. Um, and they're, they're a determined lot. They realize the obstacles and the stakes that are up against them. But, you know, they're more of an NGO movement 
than really a political party. They might get some airtime on YouTube through journeyman pictures or Vice or something like that, right? Um, and they might get a little sympathy, some shout outs, some retweets by the U.S. State Department. Um, they may get some um, invitation to an academic conference in, uh, you know, Germany or England or the United States. But they are marginalized. They are demobilized. And, you know, by and large, they're considered to be, um, you know, no threats to the ruling uh, clique. Now, the other type of hard opposition and it's one that isn't talked about a lot, but we have to, um, you know, give them attention right now, are the emerging Muslim radicals, right? So Central Asia is, by and large, um, Muslim by religious association, but very secular, right? Very, very secular in scope. So you're not going to see the type of uh, Sharia law-based Wahhabist um, uh, radicalism that you would find in Pakistan or Afghanistan or more in the Middle East here. Um, this is Islam by culture, um, Islam that has been largely denuded of its religiosity through the Soviet Union, but that is changing. Right? This is 30 years since uh, 1991. Newer generations are looking to Islam as a type of ideology to counter what they perceive to be authoritarian injustices and, you know, increasingly abuses of um, living. Um, you know, things that go against the tenets of moral philosophies that the, uh, you know, that, that the Quran, um, you know, um, uh, espouses here. And yes, they are getting money. And they are getting support from these, um, you know, Wahhabist groups within um, the Middle East. So it's not to say that it is unlikely that the Saudis, um, you know, among others, would continue to infiltrate them. But by and large, they are still marginalized. And, you know, the threat of some type of, uh, you know, Taliban-like movement in um, Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan um, is going to be met with swift retribution from the people in power by saying, hey, we see what's happening in Afghanistan and um, Pakistan. If you want that nonsense, well, please, by all means, vote for the opposition. And if you don't, well, then continue to vote for us. Um, and right now, that situation is rather accommodative, right? So top-heavy executive presidents are able to play the fear card, play the stability card, and also increasingly show that they can maintain good relations with Moscow and Beijing. So, you know, democracy is, it, it'll happen, maybe somewhere down the road, but, you know, don't get your hopes up, right? So, you know, the point to be made here is that Central Asia is really, you know, this type of more primordial state building than we would find in any other spot in our grand tour of the post-communist world. You know, I've mentioned that these countries might be primordial nations, but they're not necessarily historical states. And I know that that's, that, that could get me and anyone else saying that into, you know, some sort of trouble here, right? It's never a popular thing to go to any country and say, well, you know, your identity is largely uh, an invention from the last 50 or so years. But here's the key, folks. Almost every country around the world is founded on invented traditions and constructed identities. Central Asia is, you know, no different. It's just that we are seeing what normally would have taken place in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries in Europe and North America happening really at the end of the 20th, beginning of the 21st um, in Central Asia. Um, and when I say that there are, you know, primordial nations, but not necessarily an historical state, it's really for two reasons. One, these countries never existed as countries beforehand, right? Up to 1991, they were at the crossroads of a number of pre-modern empires, kingdoms, cognates. So that's not to say that, you know, Kazakh or Tajik or Uzbek didn't exist as an identity prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, but they were part of, as I mentioned a few slides before him, um, a larger um, polyglot community of Central Asian uh, nations and identities. But now that uh, countries have been created largely on the shape and configuration of Soviet era republics. So the borders that you see in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and others uh, were designed by others and, you know, by and large um, reflect more of a Soviet era legacy 
than any real reflection of where a specific nation resides. So that's why there's going to be uh, Tajiks and Uzbeks in Kyrgyzstan, um, some Kazakhs in, um, in Uzbekistan, some Uzbeks in uh, Turkmenistan. And, you know, we do find, unfortunately, within the last 30 years, uh, the rise of ethno-national politics that we would see in the Balkans and the Caucasus, uh, much to the detriment of a minority that, um, you know, has lived there for generations, but now is suddenly, you know, made to feel that they are second-class citizens. So the understanding of an identity in the absence of history um, isn't that nothing happened in the region up to 91, but that there hasn't been any real state-crafted national history prior to that because no state existed. I once again juxtapose Central Asia with the Georgians and the Armenians, um, and even to an extent the um, Ukrainians, in which there was a discernible history, identity, language, religion to fall back on um, during the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, the fact that many of these countries use their own ethnic language but still use the Cyrillic alphabet as opposed to um, some local alphabet um, is indicative. The fact that some of them will go to the Latin alphabet um, is even more so, right? So there is this idea that Central Asia is, you know, searching for a particular um, and discernible identity. No different, no different from other states uh, emerging on the map at some point. Um, but prior to 91, I should also add, this sense of language and history was really limited by socioeconomic class. So, you know, throughout the 1980s and, you know, even the 90s for that matter, um, the spoken language of government, of business, economy, commerce, diplomacy um, was Russian, right, was Russian. Um, and as one ascended the socioeconomic ladder, Russian became more and more of a common language. Um, you spoke it at home. It's your default language, not Tajik or Uzbek, right? That's more of the language of the, the village, right, the hinterland. Um, so the cultural heritage of these countries um, remained largely ethnographic, really the vocation of uh, cultural anthropologists rather than um, national historians. So when these countries are suddenly given sovereignty or they, they wake up to just find that they're independent states, um, that now you know, has to undergo a process of moving from you know, the hinterland to now being part of a national history. And it doesn't necessarily happen overnight. The fact that Russian is still uh, the most widely spoken and understood language, especially from people, let's say, 40 on up, um, kind of tells you, you know, the legacies of the uh, Soviet Union it still has on these countries. So, you know, this is a real interesting exercise in political culture, because as I said, n there's not one country out there that is immune from this. But when these countries are suddenly coming on the map, History is up for grabs by modern print capitalists. So prior to that, when someone asked, well, what's an Uzbek or a Tajik, um, it really was more of a localized regional identity. Now there has to be a national identity. Um, and are we part of a larger group of people? Are we Turkish? Are we Mongolian? Are we something else? Um, you know, when it comes to, let's say, Uzbekistan, for instance, um, there are certain, you know, areas of the country that have a long history of being part of the Silk Road. So, you know, the Uzbek city of Samarkand has a very long and discernible history, but Samarkand was part of whatever kingdom cognate empire that controlled it. So it has, just like Afghanistan does, this rich and multi-layered history. But is it a history that is now exclusively Uzbek? Right, as opposed to Persian or Mongolian or whatever beforehand. And, you know, there's, it, that's not to say that there are countries on the outside that are not trying to sell their identity. I know that uh, the politics of Erdogan, uh, President Erdogan of Turkey, right, loves to play this idea that Turkey is just, you know, the, uh, you know the, the more successful group of Turkish nations in which their homeland is, you know, back in Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, right? It's, they are all largely a Turkic-speaking family. 
Um, most of Central Asia doesn't really care uh, about Turkey. It's not, you know, as Petro mentioned in the previous lecture, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, you know, hey, we speak the same language, kind of, sort of, but, you know, we get more stuff from China and Russia. You know, so the only country that kind of follows Turkey around like a friend like that is Azerbaijan, different thing. Um, I remember there was one attempt in the early 90s, at least in Kazakhstan, to make the link of Kazakhs as a uh, derivative tribe of the Mongols. So there was an effort within Kazakhstan very, very early on to try to uh, create this narrative that they are somehow descendants or connected to Genghis Khan. And this is the one and only time that Mongolia really gets into the fray and is like, leave Genghis Khan out. He's ours. You can't have him. Right. And, and, you know, that's basically it. We could even go so far as to say, um, you know, again, um, Uzbekistan, Samarkand, that they have some connection to Alexander the Great. Uh, we're going back about 2,000 or so years here, um, and Samarkand was on the map, right? There are some elements of Hellenism, even within Central Asia, uh, you know, and here you can get the archaeologists and the anthropologists to have their, to have their fun, but it really is this idea of who are we, and, um, you know, what is the primary language? What's the primary history, right? We have to write history books now. Um, where do we link ourselves? Which cognate, which empire, which prior civilization do we consider to be the root of our current identity? And speaking of Samarkand, right? I mean, some areas do have um, a rich cultural tapestry with which they can tap into. Um, Uzbekistan has the privilege of having Samarkands within its borders. And, you know, by that... Um, advantage, um, you know, I'm just going to envision, I don't know, the Uzbek Ministry of Culture or something like that, right, could totally Uzbekify um, the city as well as its, you know, 2,000, 3,000 year uh, history. Um, and yes, it is, you know, part of, you know, Uzbek's, Uzbekistan's uh, tourist industry. Uh, people from, you know, the region come there. I mean, it has that historical element to it. But by and large, the rest of these cities and towns are basically Soviet era, right? So you're going to get a lot more brutalist architecture, or better yet, let's just rebuild the cities into something that looks like a Western business park, which I'll show you, uh, you know, in a couple of slides here. Um, just as a shout out once again, because we're hanging out in the region, um, this is a larger than life monument to Genghis Khan that exists in Mongolia of all places, okay? And, uh, you know, Mongolia is pretty simple. It's like, look, most people don't know about our history beyond Genghis Khan. Maybe, maybe, maybe Kublai Khan, but Genghis is where it's at. So we're going to completely go and, you know, market this thing. And, uh, you know, while you're in Mongolia checking out the Genghis Khan stuff, why not hang out in a yurt? Uh, there's some yaks where you can, you know, milk um, and eat and whatever. And, you know, Mongolian history is... Um, Pretty straightforward to outside tourism. And interestingly enough, um, yurts, um, you know, tourist yurts are all the big thing now. They're pretty expensive if you want to get the full uh, Mongolian flavor. Um, but you know, once again, Mongolia it has a far more identifiable history to the outside world than Tajikistan or uh, Turkmenistan. So, you know, the fluidity of culture is something that, you know, I'm not saying is a handicap. But it does add to the rich tapestry of Central Asia. You know, it's beyond just a no man's land between Russia and uh, China. So, um, you know, what many of these countries have done is just simply appropriate a number of previously regional cultures to official, right, cultural discourse. Um, and the fluidity of Turkic and Mongol and Persian uh, cultural traits, heritages, and historical figures um, kind of gives the emerging intellectual class within these countries the ability to kind of pick and choose from wherever they want um, and, you know, put a statue here of someone, put a monument there to someone else. You know, it's a type of retroactive historical memory, which... You know, most historical memory is retroactive. It is a lot of retconning, right? It's a way of trying to rewrite elements of the past for a national identity today. Um, but because Central Asia is off really the radar for many people, particularly in the West, and, you know, Russia doesn't really care, um, China's even less interested, 
Um, it's not to say that the national histories themselves are problematic or, or fabricated, but like most invented traditions, we take little bits and pieces of what we want and, you know, we throw them in history books and within a generation or so, these things are taken for granted. This stuff is, you know, sort of reified. One very important thing to note is that the fluidity of culture also identifies the importance of secular Islam within the region. So it is not the type of puritanical, radical Islam that defines, unfortunately, areas of Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan, but it is a religion that carried with it a way of life, um, a certain style, um, a certain way of conducting commerce and trade. You got to remember Silk Road here. So, you know, Islam is enjoying a renaissance within uh, Central Asia, uh, particularly from, you know, communities that were largely non-religious. But it's an Islam under the control of these top-down um, authoritar authoritative leaders that are not interested in really pushing the theology, right? Not pushing any kind of fundamentalism, but using it really for aesthetic purposes, for architecture. Um, you know, it's the Islam of the Silk Road, less the Islam of, you know, some Taliban that never existed within the region. So it's very similar to even Russian Orthodoxy, where the religion serves as um, a repository of culture uh, rather than, you know, dogmatic theological um, identities. And this I have to, you know, once again emphasize. When religion and culture come into the mix, theology, dogma rarely, rarely ever come up. Nobody really cares about theology. It really is for, you know, it's architecture, it's style, it's imagery, um, it's a certain set of behaviors and values, right? And at that sense, if Islam can provide um, a way in which one, you know, conducts their life with their family, with their community, well, then so be it. Obviously, there are pockets of neo-fundamentalism, particularly in, uh, you know, Tajikistan and uh, some areas of Uzbekistan. Uh, we did find this, you know, become much more militant uh, in the Caucasus, especially uh, around Chechnya. But these remain um, largely targeted by the, you know, these major longtime presidents in power. So, you know, none of these, none of these leaders um, are going to go the route of Erdogan just kind of becoming the next, uh, you know, grand mufti of Islam or something like that, right? Um, now, with all of that said, that gives us some creative questions to ask. Um, you know, Central Asia, mostly authoritarian, kind of a DIY, uh, you know, historical development. Um, does the region suffer from a case of premature statehood? Now, here you can also get a little uh, problematic. But, you know, I'm going to hang out in academia for a bit because we can get away with this. And that is, are some countries... Um, going sovereign before they have the proper institutions, the proper intelligentsia to make the state work. You know, if we get premature statehood, there's the, there's the big risk that, you know, people in power will just seize onto it, hold onto it, and just design the state really in their own image. Um, there's a couple of things to note here, um, particularly during the collapse of the Soviet Union. Central Asia displayed no visible signs of secessionism, uh, as we saw in the Baltics or even the Caucasus. So, you know, whereas you get your neighborhood effects, your, your domino democracy uh, in Central Europe, in Poland and Hungary and elsewhere, right? Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia are certainly going to see this, right? The Baltic states are going to show you that they are just as Central Europe as the rest of them are. And even within the Caucasus, right, we get demonstrations for self-determination in Georgia and uh, Armenia, but we don't see this in Central Asia. If it exists, it is very nascent. And I think when it comes to Turkmenistan, there wasn't even a single um, protest movement. So most of the region would have been perfectly happy uh, continuing to exist within a Soviet Union. I think what's also problematic is that suddenly they find themselves adrift. Um, Yeltsin, you know, initiates the breakup of the Soviet Union and previously internal borders become national. So for a brief time, uh, these countries are now economically cut off from Russia. You know, beforehand, it was just get in the car and, or the train and go. Now, these countries are separated by borders, by tariffs, by other, you know, economic indicators that make commerce and travel and trade, um, at least in the early 90s, uh, you know, much more 
problematic. And this is, inc- e- you know, equally important to note that, you know, the infrastructure within these countries was designed to work within a larger system of the Soviet Union, right? So if all the industry and the technology and the engineering of Kazakhstan uh, relied on being part of a larger Soviet state that included Russia and Ukraine and the Caucasus and the Baltics, now all of a sudden that chain of dependency has been cut. So you're kind of, you know, left there Um, you're sort of like in the middle of the assembly line waiting for stuff to come in for you to work on, but that stuff's not coming in anymore. And whatever you are working on still, and you're sending it out for the next thing, is not taking it. So it's not a surprise that Central Asia um, produces the highest levels of worker migration and remittances because the jobs, the infrastructure um, is much more sustainable in Russia. Uh, The only one out of all five of the stand countries that, you know, was able to initially, uh, you know, become relatively self-sufficient was Kazakhstan. Um, And that's just because of its size and I think relative importance uh, within the uh, the Soviet Union. Right. You think about the old Soviet Union. I mean, it really kind of was, you know, Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan were, you know, the three big areas there. So there was some ability to continue on. But Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, comparatively speaking, very poor. Uh, very peripheral and, uh, you know, largely cut off. Um, So in this sense, it's not a surprise for Russia, even in the Yeltsin period, to reach out to Central Asia as a no-brainer and say, okay, let's renegotiate now on a state-by-state level um, economic cooperative packages that are going to be beneficial for both of us. But at the end of the day, it's going to benefit Russia. Um, So Central Asia was always in Russia's backyard, Um, much easier for Russia to reach out to than the Baltics, which basically flipped them the finger and said, I'm out of here. I'm playing in the EU Um, or Ukraine, which is kind of happy to sit there and just, you know, take proposals from various suitors. Central Asia, no one was coming to help them out. And you got to also remember, this is the 90s. China is not where it was today. So it was just simply natural for these countries to reach out to Russia um, first to reestablish, you know, some kind of tie. Now, with that said, there is this continued uh, brain drain um, that existed even within the Soviet period, right? So you were of some intellectual promise within these Central Asian places. You know, you didn't want to stay in these local towns and cities that were under the control of, you know, a small cadre of individuals. So you went to find your fortune, you went to find a better life for yourself in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Novosibirsk, somewhere, anywhere like that, right? Well, this was redoubled in the 90s. So anyone that might have been um, valuable for the development of these countries, um, infrastructure-wise, intellectual-wise, bought a one-way ticket and like, you know what, I I don't got time for this, and went to Russia. So Russia benefited uh, from this brain drain in the 90s, which left the countries basically with two groups of people. One very small group of political cadres that are like, cool, I own the country and there goes my opposition, bye. And everyone else, which is just kind of like, well, I'm just waiting to see what happens. So, you know, the brain drain certainly contributes to the authoritarianization of these countries. Certainly doesn't, you know, blunt it. But, um, you know, what it also does is keep these countries um, perennially dependent on larger neighboring countries. So, you know, this entrenches um, autocratic leadership, um, leaving any kind of civil society or discussions of democracy um, really few and far between outside of whatever university courses might offer it. You know, if you really wanted to engage in democracy, just once again, you know, just go to go to Russia and then now all of a sudden that's not working. So I don't know, go to the United States or go to the West and, you know, try to find something there. So again, premature statehood is something that, um, you know, we can opine by saying, you know, look, are there countries that are offered statehood before they're ready? And, you know, there's lots of countries on the map today, many of them with UN memberships that, you know, seem much more compact and united on a map than they do in, uh, in real life. Is this the same thing? for Central Asia. Um, so it's, you know, if we, if we take that, um, if we take that argument and we think, all right, 
weak institutions, no time for transition, brain drain. Uh, what does that leave the people who run the country? Well, there's our sovereign democratic despotism, right? There's our type of authoritarianism that, um, you know, gives us proto ideas of sovereign democracy under Putin, um, but doesn't really go into that second half, right? If you understand sovereign democracy is saying, look, we need stability, order, um, the foundations of the state need to be uh, created first, and then we'll kind of gravitate over to political rights and civil liberties. We'll open the electoral process up to people afterwards, right? Sort of the founding fathers model. Um, Central Asia is still primarily within that founding model. Now we're going 30 years out now. Um, you know, so this type of leadership precedes the sovereign democracy of Putin by about a decade, but remains overwhelmingly authoritarian, right? If there's any discussion of when are we going to increase political rights and civil liberties, I mean, that's just even worse than what's happening in Russia. And why would they? I mean, why would they? I mean, we're talking about a small cadre of individuals with power, privilege, and leverage that uh, control the country in all manners, um, economically, industrially, um, media-savvy-wise, consumer-driven-wise. Um, you know, you, you see this on full display in uh, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, the two uh, of the most repressive um, of the five. Um, you know, so that leads us to kind of say, all right, well, who are these people? Um, you know, who are these people? Who are these uh, personas that uh, define, um, you know, Central Asian leadership? And, you know, usually, you know, every single country, with the exception of Kyrgyzstan, has one, like, long-lasting founding father that just set the mold for everyone else. And if there is one person to begin uh, this type of leadership in Central Asia, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, um, gets first billing. He is the quintessential Central Asian executive leader. Um, his tenure in power was almost, almost 30 years. Um, he was the uh, president of Kazakhstan basically from its independence in 1991 until his retirement. He stepped down in 2019. But he's kind of like, you know, dictator emeritus. You know, I think I mentioned that in the, in the Petro speech, right? So he's not dead. He's very much alive. He's in his 80s. Um, his power and his influence is pervasive. Um, but he retired, you know, I guess he just wants to enjoy the, you know, the, you know, the fruits of his, uh, you know, golden years. And is succeeded by Qasem Jomar Tokayev, right, who's been in power since 2019. Now, we don't know much about Tokayev. All we can surmise is that if he is the successor to Nazarbayev, there has to have been some, you know, planned approval, right? So we're not talking about a major changeover of power. There's no major election. There's no revolution. There's no change in the constitution. Um, you know, Tokayev most likely is like to Kazakhstan what Dmitry Medvedev is to uh, Russia, right? And, and, and Nazarbayev is certainly still there, um, behind the scenes, heavily, heavily, heavily influential. Um, and, you know, I guarantee you that when he dies, um, he will most likely um, have his, his, you know, supporters will have a huge state funeral, um, very similar to, you know, some king or czar that, uh, you know, that dies. Um, Uzbekistan, same thing. The longtime leader of uh, Uzbekistan was Islam Karamov. You can see once again, 1991, but this time he dies, right? He dies in 2016. And, um, you know, Kadimov's leadership was much more closed off. Uzbekistan was much more hermetically sealed uh, than Kazakhstan was, right? Kazakhstan was kind of open to the world under Nazarbayev's power brokerage leadership, right? Kadimov was much more um, internal, um, desiring to make the country as self-sufficient as possible. Um, his death led to uh, rumors that his daughter would take over, right? And normally, you know, the offspring, the child certainly has influence. Uh, Nazarbayev's daughter is heavily, heavily influential in, uh, in Kazakh politics. But um, a surprise changeover, right? We read in the papers that uh, Karimov would be succeeded by Shavkat Mirzioyev, um, not related to Karimov at all. And while the country still remains um, incredibly authoritarian, there have been efforts by Mirzioyev to begin the process of reform, 
right? He's gradually moving the country's leadership away from, you know, old world blood ties and, you know, Vito Corleone, you know, cooperatives here to something more on the lines of technocratic development. So don't get too excited that there's going to be this emerging democratic civil society. But within the last five years or so, right, Uzbekistan has stepped in from the dark, right? Tashkent is now um, open to Western universities. If you remember, my colleague Mlade Murda is actually teaching at an American university, but on, uh, you know, a remote campus uh, within uh, Tashkent, Uzbekistan. And so this is kind of the, you know, the, you know, the nascent steps that uh, Uzbekistan is making in, you know, engaging the world. Now, when we get to Turkmenistan, this is my, this is my favorite country. This is my absolute, absolute favorite one because no one can do Central Asian despotic leadership better than Sapur Murat Niyazov, or more commonly and lovingly remembered as Turkmenbashi, right? Turkmenbashi, a name he gives himself, the greatest Turk out there. Um, Turkmenbashi's uh, rule over Turkmenistan was almost cult-like. Um, the imagery, the statues that were built for him uh, many of them in solid gold. Um, the the type of philosophy that Niyazov had um, uh, promoted in this book of his called the Ruk Nama. It's kind of like um, a hodgepodge of Islamic philosophies, his own musings. It's a personal biography. Um, it's within this book that um, apparently... You know, children had to memorize parts of the book in order to get a driver's license. Um, he had passed all sorts of laws within the country, basically forbidding women to wear makeup because, in his mind, Turkmen women were beautiful as it was, which is a nice thing to say. I mean, you know, but um, I think he also closed down all the dentists within the country, saying that uh, people with tooth problems should just gnaw on dog bones or something like that. I think it was like one or two dentists in um in, in, in Dushnabi, the, the capital of Turkmenistan. Um, he renamed the months of the year um, to, I don't know, I think he named one or two after himself, one after his mother, um, you know, all sorts of great stuff. I mean, this is the, the, this is the stereotypical nonsense that, you know, created the Borat movies, right? I mean, we're just talking about this, some, some far-flung um, dictator from some country that nobody ever knows about. Um, and when he dies in in 2006 and i shouldn't say that he dies i think that his just his soul transcended the limits of physical human consciousness um, and he just kind of evolved into the next ethereal being or whatever it was right um, his book the ruknama was read by him and uh, launched into space actually so somewhere out there, there's a satellite uh, where just, you know, passages from the Ruknama are just being broadcast into the void, hopefully being picked up by another planet. And uh, maybe when we establish contact with life on another planet at some point and uh, we find that uh, all their women are not wearing makeup because, you know, they look beautiful as is, you're like, oh, someone heard, someone heard Turkmenbashi's philosophies. That's fantastic. Now, the other great thing about Turkmenistan is that you think, all right, the guy dies, he's got to be succeeded by someone who is more pragmatic, right? A little bit more rational. Oh, no, I want to introduce you to, and try to see if you can pronounce this, Gurbangali Birdi Muhadamov, right? Just rolls off the tongue, right? Gurbangali Birdi Muhadamov uh, has been in charge of Turkmenistan since 2006. He's basically Turk. He's basically Turkmenbashi II. Um, he creates his own um, cult of personality, um, you can actually find videos of him on YouTube. Um, I think, you know, I think he's jamming with his son or his grandson uh, to uh, Turkmen rap or Turkmen rock and roll. Um, great stuff. Just absolute great stuff. Um, he's a big fan of uh, horses, um, dogs. Um, you know, he's a big, big fan of promoting this idea that, the, that, that Turkmenistan is a country of wild horses running through the Central Asian steppe. I think John Oliver did a skit on him. Um, at one point, um, but the country remains at North Korean levels of repression, right? So if you go to Turkmenistan, you will have a guide, you will have a monitor following you around. Um, you know, you'll see that the capital is very open and modern looking, but there's hardly any traffic um, out there, right? Um, 
Then we get to Tajikistan, kind of like the exact opposite. Whereas Turkmenistan is just big and ostentatious, Tajikistan is one of the poor of the five. And I only have one president here, Emo Mali Rahmon. Um, and that is because uh, Tajikistan underwent a series of turmoils between 91 and 94, right? So whereas all the other countries were kind of like under the solid control of one person, um, Tajikistan underwent a civil war. Um, and it only stabilized in 94 under Rahman, who continues uh, to govern the country, govern, rule, control, whatever it is that you want to say. Um, so he's really the last of what I would call the original old guard. Um, you know, Rahman is the last old guard to still control um, the country from its basic foundation uh, following 1991. Then we get to Kyrgyzstan. Now, Kyrgyzstan's, the, again, the oddball one. Kyrgyzstan's kind of the, um, the nonconformist here. And whereas I showed you up to two leaders for each of these countries, Kyrgyzstan has the largest number of presidents and leaders uh, within its last 30 years. Um, we begin with the 15-year leadership of Askar Akayev. Now, Akayev is interesting because he's not an old-school Communist Party boss like Nazarbayev or Karimov or Niazov or anything else. Right? Akayev was a teacher. So he's coming from already a nascent, very nascent, civil society movement within Kyrgyzstan. Um, and that kind of sets the stage for what happens afterwards. Now, because he's in power as long as he is, right? eventually right, there will be um, an election that replaces him. And... He was ultimately defeated 15 years later uh, in, tw in 2005 by Kurmanbak Bakiev. And this was the movement that largely defined the so-called Tulip Revolution, right? So Kyrgyzstan gets its own colored revolution, the only one in Central Asia to do so. But here's the problem. Well, not so much a problem, because if you know what colored revolutions do, you kind of are like, well, here's the reality. Bakiev becomes increasingly authoritarian increasingly corrupt. So it's not that it's an improvement from Akayev, but Bakiev almost, you know, entrenches himself in power even further to the point where there is another tulip revolution to get him out in 2010. And that is when we get to, in my opinion, the most important person in all of Central Asian political history over the last 30 years. And even though she was only in power for about a year, right? Rosa Atunbaeva um, is immensely important for Kyrgyzstan for a number of reasons. First, she's the region's only female leader. Number two, she comes from intellectual and diplomatic credentials. So she was Kyrgyzstan's first foreign diplomat. Um, I believe that she even re represented uh, Kyrgyzstan at the UN in the early 90s. So she becomes the country's interim president. And it's under her rule, under her presidency, that she also very successfully transforms the country from a presidential to a parliamentary system, which means that at least under her tenure, power is going to increasingly be diverted to a prime minister. So there's much more of an electoral presence within Kyrgyzstan. All the other four countries remain presidential. Now, you might think to yourself, hey, this is pretty cool, right? Atambayeva has some, you know, legit street cred. And she does um, among the, you know, the population of uh, Bishkek. You can, if you go there today, you can see her, you know, sitting in coffee shops and talking with locals um, like just anyone else. And you're like, oh, that was once the president of uh, Kyrgyzstan for about a year. Unfortunately, um, she was kind of moved out of power. Um, she could not run for what was supposed to have been the next legitimate election. So she's basically just sitting there in a, as a, in a caretaker position, um, finishing out Bakiev's term after he was forced from power in the Tulip Revolution Part Two. And it was under some bogus explanation that, um, you know, in order to run for president, you have to be in Kyrgyzstan for like five consecutive years. And because she was, um, you know, U.N. diplomat, foreign minister, um, you know, an academic, you know, out giving talks and whatever about democracy in Kyrgyzstan, that kind of um, disqualified her from running. 
So she was probably the most successful, but had to yield um, to these draconian electoral laws um, and is succeeded by Almazbek Atambayev, right, who runs, uh, you know, as president uh, for about a five, six year term. Um, he is succeeded uh, by Soron Be um in from 2017 to 2021. Of course, if you do the math here, there's also another revolution, another uh, power play in Kyrgyzstan that removes Jayenbekov, and uh, Kyrgyzstan's current president is Sadir uh, Japarov. Now, you might think, well, why are we still talking about presidents if uh, Otto, uh, Atombaeva moved the country to a parliamentary system? Things very gradually and, you know, but thoroughly move back to a presidential system. So by the time we get to Jayenbekov and Japarov, um, whatever parliamentary democracy idea that uh, Rosa had uh, envisioned is largely disbanded, discarded. So, you know, Kyrgyzstan's move towards some fledgling democracy really, um, you know, is given. And, you know, credit should be given to Rosa uh, Atombaeva. Um, and, you know, I guess, held in some way under Atambayev, under Almazbek Atambayev, but um, it was basically downhill, unfortunately, uh, from 2017 onward. Um, so there's the leaders. Let's take a look at the capital cities that they govern from. I mean, you want to see money and industry um, working great with authoritarian leadership. I mean, these capitals look like business parks. You know? This is not your Soviet-era Central Asia anymore. I mean, you know, this kind of looks like a World Cup monument here. But, um, you know, let's start with uh, Kazakhstan's capital. Um, Kazakhstan has had two capitals. Uh, the original one was um, uh, called Almaty. The capital moved to this brand new place called Astana and uh, was renamed... Surprise, surprise, Nur Sultan. Try to figure out who it's named after. Right, so the capital is named after the longtime president of the country. And, you know, because the whole capital was a brand new building project, um, skyscrapers and public gardens and fancy palaces, um, along with, you know, sort of romantic, almost Ottoman, Persian era, uh, even Byzantine architecture in their mosques um, are just creating these major, major, major projects. So, you know, Islam, as I've said, um, certainly has its roots within Central Asia, but was never any real um, religious force to begin with. But these mosques, these these Agia Sophia size mosques that are being built across the region um, are just simply testament to the power and the wealth um, of those that, you know, run the country. And, you know, they are certainly there for, you know, photographic display looking something right out of um, a fairy tale. Very similar, very similar to the type of mosque building or unfortunately mosque converting uh, that exists in uh, Erdogan's uh, Turkey. When we get to um, Ashgabat, the capital of Turkmenistan, uh, we find that the monuments are slightly more weird, uh, a little bit more creative. Um, one student of mine uh, many, many years ago looked at this and called it a uh, totalitarian dream catcher. Um, I think, well, it's not bad, you know, definitely not bad there. But, um, you know, Ashgabat, um, the capital city of uh, um, you know, both uh, the first and the second Turkmenbashis are Pyongyang, really, in their um, outline, right? We have these big, grand, straight-edge boulevards um, that are populated by hardly any cars at all. So this is not at, like, 5 o'clock in the morning here. This is just like, you know, most people can't afford to have cars. And if you do, you know, you're either a tourist or you are part of the uh, ruling clique. Um, but, um, you know, many of these monuments are also testament to the um, long-standing history, the cultural history of what predated the modern Turkmen states, Uzbek, whatever state that you want, with monuments to these, you know, middle, um, you know, m medieval kagans and princes that many people knew very little about, but they're kind of, you know, dragged from the pages of the past, and they now stand as sentinels, you know, in many of these monuments re um, here. And it's just, you know, a way of trying to promote this idea that, 
you know, look, there's more to Central Asia than what Mongolia has, what the Silk Road has. And, you know, over time, um, these figures from the past will be seen as taken for granted cultural icons uh, for each of these countries. Of course, some of the monuments in uh, Turkmenistan uh, were built for the current, you know, Khan, uh, specifically uh, Turkmenbashi. This looks like a rocket ship. I mean, it definitely is this despotic Disneyland, uh, which is a great way to describe the region. And uh, the statue of Turkmenbashi, this is an older picture. It has since been removed, but it's a gold, solid gold statue of uh, Niazov, which turned. It rotated to constantly face the sun, if you can believe it. How awesome is that? And my guess is that, you know, this monument is itself a rocket ship that may, if necessary, you know, ascend into the heavens and, um, I don't know, continue to spout the uh, philosophies um, of uh, Turkmenbashi's Ruknama, which, here's the book. Here's a monument to the book. It is on a rotating platform, and when nighttime comes, um, there, oh, this is a fantastic, fantastic monument here, because the book will open like Walt Disney style, the book will open and there will be these um, projected, you know, LED, you know, images onto the blank pages of the book with the words of the Ruknama. And there's fountains that water will spig, you know, here, 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 here. Lots of music to play. I mean, it's like some, like I said, you know, despotic Disneyland that, uh, you know, you can go to get your picture taken. It's a beautiful romantic evening out with a date of yours, you know, fantastic. Um, Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Uh, very much like uh, Nur Sultan uh, Kazakhstan, is now under major, major, major building projects, especially um, under the um, Mirziyoyev uh, regime. Um, you know, hotels, um, business parks, universities, public grounds. It is just money that is just being pumped in uh, from the country's, you know, controlled resources, also heavily invested, uh, you know, is Russia and uh, China, to the idea that, you know, if I was to show you this picture without the location, you might look at it and say, oh, this looks like Dubai, um, or this could be Moscow. And if I was to say it's Uzbekistan, you'd be like, I had no idea. Um, but yeah, I mean, just the, um, the, the, the imagery that's coming from Central Asian states now is a way of showcasing, right, the money and the importance of how, where they are placed geographically, but also money coming in from heavy, heavy investments, not just from the Russians and the Chinese, from the Iranians, from the Indians, right? This is a region that enjoys wealth without having to invest anything in democratic development. Now, when we get to the comparatively poorer countries of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, the monuments are a little bit more humble, right? They're not as ostentatious. They're not as grandiose as we find in the others. More to the point, you will most likely see um, buildings from the Soviet era, very much that communist, brutalist style, but um, still monuments and statues to cultural figures from uh, Tajikistan's, you know, alleged um, rich cultural past. And if you have no idea who they are, thank goodness these monuments are here to now tell you um, who they are and what they've accomplished and how they are, um, you know, the intellectual founders um, of these countries and these nations. Still, um, Tajikistan has um, most of the money thrown into the presidential palace. Um, lots of faux columns and whitewashed marble. Um, it is one of the largest <laughs> You know, um, houses of executive leadership uh, within the region. Um, you know, Rahman has come under you know significant criticism for basically like, look, you know, if the roads leading up to the you know presidential palace are in dire need of paving, um, if uh, the internal you know plumbing within the capital is also problematic, but all the money is gone here, uh, you kind of know, you know, that there's you know a good degree of corruption. I'm pretty certain there's a private international airport. Uh, in the backyard. But, you know, over the top displays of wealth um, and opulence uh, with that type of quasi gaudy, um, you know, I don't know, neo baroque, uh, neoclassical 
um, architecture. You know, usually is you know the you know the um, the favored display of people with um, you know an ego. You know, I mean, you know, where can we find that? You know, maybe in the West. I mean, I don't know. But, oh wait, how'd that picture get here? Oops, sorry. Wait, let's just keep moving on here. All right, anyway. Um, finally, we get to Kyrgyzstan, which. For those of you who are taking this class at Rutgers, you might look at this and say, this looks a lot like Livingston Campus. You know? The buildings are definitely more brutalistic, right? We're not talking about big palatial stuff, not surprisingly, right? Kyrgyzstan does not have the wealth, and it doesn't have the sultanistic leadership that you would find in Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan, right? You know, uh, last I checked, Kyrgyzstan has, I think, six official presidents, and that's not including the, uh, the interim ones that sometimes come and go, you know, in a, in a few weeks and months here. But, um, you know, Kyrgyzstan, you know, certainly is reflective of the lesser, the diminished wealth that it has with its other partners. Um, but I think the other issue here with Kyrgyzstan, we're going to talk about this more in a standalone lecture, is that the country is much more decentralized, much more politically fragmented, um, than these others, right? And we, you know, we can talk about political leaders within the regional cities, which tells you that the country is not as top-down organized as Kazakhstan and others. And it gives us some hope, right, that there might be a third tulip revolution, you know, at some point in the, uh, in the future. But, you know, until that time, right, is this building here kind of looks like the library, the Livingston uh, Campus Library uh, at Rutgers, right? Not, uh, you know, definitely, definitely built in the 60s um, or the 70s. So anyway, you know, Central Asia, 25 to 30 years later, and we covered a lot of ground here today. And, uh, you know, this is a good way of stopping before we get more specific in our next lecture. But, um, you know, the outlook is kind of grim as far as democracy uh, is concerned, if that's what you're looking for. Um, we have seen a sustained monopoly on political and economic power by a ruling elite. Um, and when there is a successor to the alleged presidential throne, they more often than not come from power and privilege as well. Um, and especially in a place like Kazakhstan, um, there cannot be uh, really any big, you know, changeover of power um, unless Nazarbayev, who's still alive, um, has some say in that. So, we, you know, when transitions of power happen, they are changes in leadership, right? Not governance, right? The only time that there was that one exception was Kyrgyzstan. And, um, you know, that explains a number of other things. Many of these countries, at least the first four, have a small, if nascent, middle class and civil society. Um, what civil society might have existed? Maybe already went off to Russia to find work. But what this does is that it enables the ruling classes to use industries that are still heavily nationalized for private gain and empowerment. So these building projects and these grandiose mosques and palatial skyscrapers, whatever. I mean, this is state funding. This is state money that is used to, you know, reward uh, those in power with, you know, architectural bling, uh, for lack of better you know, terminology here. And look, because the region remains outside the sphere of influence of the European Union, and uh, has never really come under any importance by the United States. The region is, for the most part, um, at the beck and call of uh, Moscow and Beijing. You know, to a lesser extent, Iran and uh, India. So if India is really the only, like, mm. democracy with, you know, w of, the, of the bunch, again, India doesn't really care. India cares about economics, not about democratic policy. So wealth... Mobilization, leverage, privilege, access to the upper echelons um, come from connection to these larger states, which, of course, reinforces connections from previously established political cadres and clientelistic networks. So it's who you know, who you are married to, um, in some cases, what you pay to get in, and that is going to give you access to all of the wealth, the opulence, and the privileges. Um, if you have money and you are living in these areas, you can live quite a good life, right? If you are an American, a European, and you somehow want to um, move to Central Asia, 
um, and you can still retain your American or European salary, I mean, you're going to live like a king. Right? There's no question about it. Um, you know, are you happy with the lack of, you know, political pluralism? You know, hey, you know, restaurants and casinos and other things are going to, you know, dampen that, uh, you know, dampen that sour mood. But yes, yeah, Central Asia, largely, if not entirely, um, authoritarian. And, uh, you know, that is, uh, you know, where we can stop right now before we uh, kind of take a little trek through Kyrgyzstan to take a look at why Kyrgyzstan seemed to have uh, bucked that trend, if, you know, only for a few years, but also whether Kyrgyzstan has the potential to do it again. That is something we're going to look at in more specifics in the next lecture. Um, that will be followed by our guest uh, speaker, Dr. Lawrence Markowitz from Rowan University, who is here to finish our coverage of the region by you know, answering all questions about Central Asia and uh, why it's worth studying. So I hope that this was interesting. I always love teaching. I love teaching Central Asia just because nobody knows about it, but when they find out about it, they just get real, real, real excited. So I hope that this sparked your interest, and I hope that you'll join me in the next lecture where we look at Kyrgyzstan, the little country that possibly, possibly can. All right, stay tuned, everyone.